Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Starting off the news this week, research has been published in the journal Nature that has looked at the reasons behind the survival of a planet that survived its star's death, despite being relatively close by. 8 Ursae Minoris b, also known as Halla, is a gas giant orbiting around the star 8 Ursae Minoris, also known as Baekdu. Baekdu, as a helium-burning star, would have previously collapsed from its hydrogen-burning state. At the distance that Hella is away from Baekdu, one would very much expect it to be engulfed, but astronomers in the past have been wondering why this wasn't the case. This study looks to answer that question. Astronomers from the University of Warwick and the University of Hawaii suggest that Baekdu may have once had a companion star that interacted with it via mass transfer, preventing Baekdu from expanding enough to consume Hella. This idea, based on detailed observations made using the TESS Space Telescope and facilities at the WM Keck Observatory and the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope, suggests that Halla may have once orbited two stars at different life stages. Another possibility is that Halla was formed by materials being ejected by the two stars merging, effectively making it a second-generation planet in the star system. This idea, although rather speculative, opens up new and exciting discussions about planet formation in binary systems, an aspect of astronomy that we still find relatively mysterious. Halla is the first planetary system around a helium star to be discovered, showing that it is indeed possible in the universe and extending the possible life for planetary systems in comparison to our previous knowledge. And in other news, NASA's Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution, or MAVEN, spacecraft, using an imaging ultraviolet spectrograph RUVS, instrument, has successfully captured two impressive images of Mars, providing previously unexplored potential insights into the planet's atmospheric and surface characteristics. The RUVS measures wavelengths outside the visible light spectrum, and these images have been colour-coded to be studied by astronomers here on Earth. The first image, captured in the Martian Southern Hemisphere's summer season of July 2022, features notable surface characteristics such as the Argyre Basin, one of Mars's deepest craters, filled with atmospheric haze depicted in pale pink, and the Valles Manonarius canyons filled with tan-coloured clouds. The image also illustrates the southern polar ice cap shrinking due to summer warmth and dust storms, driving water vapour to high altitudes offering an explanation for Mavin's observation of enhanced hydrogen loss from Mars during this season. The second image, captured in January 2023 from the Martian Northern Hemisphere after Mars had passed its furthest point from the Sun, shows an abundance of white clouds thanks to Mars's rapidly changing seasons. This image also shows an ozone buildup during the northern winter's colder polar nights and its reduction in the spring due to chemical reactions with atmospheric water vapour. An amazing new release that will help us look at our neighbour in quite a different light. And now over to Ben with some paleontology news. Thanks, Doug. First up in the paleontology news for this week is a very interesting new study that has found Megalodon to be partly warm-blooded. Using two different techniques of isotope analysis on the fossil teeth of this shark, one called clumped isotope paleothermometry, and the other looking at phosphate oxygen isotopes, the researchers have been able to tell that Megalodon had a higher body temperature than the surrounding environment it lived in. The paleontologists proposed that Megalodon therefore had something called regional endothermy, which is seen in some other modern sharks, whereby certain parts of the body are maintained at a higher temperature thanks to heat exchanges in the body. This regional endothermy possibly enabled Megalodon's lineage to grow to such enormous sizes, and it also would have made the shark more able to cope with colder waters, increasing its range. However, it might also help to explain Megalodon's eventual extinction, as the metabolic costs of maintaining a higher body temperature, coupled with its gigantism, would have made the species particularly vulnerable to changing structures of marine communities and climatic shifts. So, Megalodon had some very interesting adaptations that allowed it to get so big and become such a successful predator. Also in the news is a fascinating study that has estimated the time of origin for placental mammals, the lineage of mammals that includes us. 
Using a statistical analysis of the fossil record of placentals, the researchers find the most support for a model in which they originated before the end Cretaceous mass extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs. Although no definite fossils of placentals have so far been found in the Cretaceous, evidence from molecular clocks have long since suggested an origin in this period, and this new technique using known fossils agrees with the Cretaceous origin. Placental mammals therefore seem to have appeared just before the extinction event, and the various different modern groups of placentals would have arisen at the boundary or just after, in the Paleogene. It's a really interesting new technique that's been applied to the fossil record, with some fascinating results. Up next, we've got an interesting publication reporting on cut marks inflicted by a human on another hominin bone. This report represents the oldest direct evidence of this behaviour, coming from a site in Kenya that dates to the early Pleistocene, about 1.45 million years ago. The hominin bone in question is a left tibia, and it's unclear whether it belonged to a species of the Homo genus, or if it belonged to Australopithecus, or maybe even Paranthropus. So for now, it's referred to as an indeterminate hominin. This bone shows something very interesting though, a series of small scratches on one side that are consistent with marks created by stone tools, as confirmed by 3D model analysis. The researchers therefore propose that this is the oldest known evidence of human anthropophagy, not necessarily cannibalism though, as the identities of the victim and the user of the tools are both unknown. More recent examples of different hominins butchering each other are also known, including among groups of Neanderthals and ancient members of Homo sapiens, as well as a population of either Homo erectus or Homo heidelbergensis from France that lived about 680,000 years ago, in addition to others. This paper, though, shows that the behaviour goes back even further in time. The purpose of the cutting of this individual is hypothesised to have been in order to deflesh this particular bone, based on where the cut marks are, and that if this individual was then consumed by another hominin, it was probably for the functional reason of obtaining food instead of any ritualistic purpose. This is an intriguing, if slightly grim, discovery then, showing that these ancient hominins were not letting anything go to waste, and it's an amazing example of prehistoric behaviour preserved in the fossil record. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time.